So let us listen to what the Word of God counsels us. I personally, I'm not a great... Uh, what's the mess for voorstander? I'm not a great promoter of counseling, although I come from the counseling world. This is where counseling should take place most, mostly. Yes, we do listen, and we do speak uh, to people there, beside, but this is where the most counsel takes place, from the pulpit. And that is, to me, wonderful. It's fair, because the truth comes to each one of us in whatever way we need to hear it. Because the truth is not... Like Caesar asked Jesus, what is truth? When Jesus stood in front of him. It is the wrong question. Because truth is not what. Truth is who. Truth is a person. Truth is living. Jesus Christ. Yeshua Moshiach. So truth, when truth comes to you, it means he comes in a person. And when you say yes to truth, you say yes to Jesus. Not just, it's not a, the principle. He is the truth. Right. Let us pray together. Lord, there's no way that we can impress you. There's no way that we can I don't know what to say, but you know exactly where each one of us stand. You will know exactly who each one of us is. You see through us you look at our hearts and you look at our will. It is obvious to you who we are. We can never surprise you. And therefore we ask, Lord, that you will come with your eyes of fire eyes of fire and light and love and stand before each one of us and as you put us in the balance Kadesh we pray Lord we will always be, be found wanting we pray that you will Put your son, Yeshua Moshiach, as our atonement before you. And as you turn our balances and our scales this morning when we listen to your word, work in us and help us that we will put truth every time. Where we are found wanting. That we will put truth in the scales. Your word says that truth saves us. Your word says, when you spoke to your disciples, you, do, you said that it is your truth that is sanctified. Therefore, we pray that you will sanctify us this morning as we listen to your truth. Work in and through each one of us that your name and your character will be blessed and worshipped and reverenced and embraced and cherished, loved with our whole being. Work in us, Lord, we pray. Turn us. 
Turn us that we may serve you. Work in us that we may serve and worship you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We're still talking about judgment today. Usually when we hear the word judgment, we feel that it doesn't belong as a theme in a church to study. But if we understand what judgment is about, we know that it is Lord's, the Lord's mercy and His grace that He judges. Now the question is, why do many Christians make so such so much, make so much wrong choices or decisions? Many times, not always, but many times you see that Christians make obviously wrong choices. What do I need? What do we need to make good choices or good decisions? What I do need is. I need to take notice of God's judgments in my life. Now, if we understand judgments, then we will realize that God is all the time passing judgments in our lives. Judgments come in the form of situations. You find yourself in a certain, in a certain situation where you need to make certain calculations and decisions that is judgments all things means all events all circumstances people coming to you people in your world and in your life anything is ways that God judges us what does he judge he judges sin in your life so anything that brings out sin in your life is because of a judgment that God has passed upon the sin in you. And we can only repent of, of what we know is wrong. That's why he brings the judgment so that we can see certain things that we haven't seen before in our lives. What is sin? Sin means missing the target. What is the target? The target is the purpose. The purpose for our existence. Why do you breathe? Why are you here this morning? Why are you comptus mentis? It's not, definitely not because you are smart. Definitely not. Not because you did something good. Because God is busy with His Kingdom training in your life. God trains us through judgments, through circumstances, and through situations, and through people. He trains us so that we can discern and learn to discern between what to do and what not to do. What to choose or what not to choose. Making decisions is about verdicts. Na uitsprake. Uitsprake wat jy maak. We've learned last week that you get favorable and unfavorable verdicts. Last week we've learned about, uh, we've uh, read Proverbs chapter 1 verse 3. I'm just quoting it to you. We read there, receiving instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment and equity. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 3. The symbol of the kingdom is a four square. Yud, hey, vo, hey. This is not how we see it. This is what Hebrew teaches. And, and last week I, I read about a new discovery of Hebrew 
and they estimated that the pictographic Hebrew alphabet is at least 4,000 years old, at least. It's more between four and 6,000 years. And they were deciphering portions of scripture that they have found in Jerusalem with excavations. Right. Last week, I showed you and I explained. It is here we find the principle of the scales. With the principle of the tabernacle with his different pieces of furniture. The reason why I'm saying that is to fill in your understanding of what the principles, what all the principles involved when we talk about God's judgment. God's judgment is the word in Hebrew Mishpah. We've just read there in Proverbs 1 verse 3, receiving the reason why the book of Proverbs was written down for us, and the reason why the whole Bible is written down for us, so that we will receive instruction in wisdom. He says justice, Justice, judgment, and equity. Equity comes from the word equal. It's here where God equalizes your ups and downs. He brings an even keel. To your ups and downs of feeling good or feeling bad, being happy, being unhappy, moving on your house, on your mountaintop experiences, and growling down here in your, mount, in your valley experiences. God wants to equalize it by taking you through life experiences and balance you out through his judgments. While you are standing here in your, in your body, there's a whole system going on, according to science. Now, if you will look to me the way that I'm explaining with my hands, how does an atom work? An atom has inside of it a kernel, and around it runs electrons, and neutrons, electrons and protons and neutrons, it's going on like this in one atom. You consist out of millions of them. Out of millions of them, there's a running clockwise and anti-clockwise. That is the movement of life. Now, when we talk about receiving instruction, in what way does God give us instruction? He uses the written word, the Torah, the written word, the written principles that you have on your lap. That is the one side. And God uses the unwritten Torah, which comes through nature, that comes through life, through experience, through events in life. Life in itself is a book, is a Torah. Life in itself has got instruction in it. And both are written by the same lawgiver. 
who is God himself. Because those two books, the books of nature and the written book of God, they are one, one voice. So all decision making, this is where you are. All decision making is about God's kingdom. It's about kingdom building. So many times we hear about kingdom building. God builds and wants to build and form his character because it's about his character, his nature, that he wants to build and that he's building inside of us, in our lives. It's talking about kingdom living. We are either allowing him to build his kingdom in us or not. All right, now how does God do it in practice? In the Hebrew, the word talks about extremities or, or uttermosts. Uttermosts. In Hebrews, is it chapter 7, I think, verse 25? I'm, I stand under correction. It says there, if you check it, just say yes or no. Uh, it says there, Lord, save me. So it's Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Save me to the uttermost. Red me to the uiterste to here. That is to where God wants to save you. Because if you do not allow him to save you to the uttermost, you will fall away. The uttermost, the word in Hebrew for the word uttermost means corner. So save me and take me to every corner in my life. The corners in your life are the extremes, the ends of yourself. So God will take you to the ends of yourself, to your corners, so that he can save you to the uttermost. I hope that is clear. Because so many times I have grabbed my own head and I said, Lord, you are now taking me to the end of myself. And he says, wonderful. At least you understand something. I will definitely take you to the end of yourself. I will take you to every corner in your life. Because I want to, my name is hidden in that corner. And I want to reveal my name in that corner to you. And I want that name to be built into your life, into your character. Do you want it or don't you want it? So the uttermost talks about the extremities. The ends of yourself. So now, I hope that answers your question. Because the questions in Christianity is, why does God do this? He's breaking me. Yes, all right. Carry on, what is your question? <laughs> Why is God taking me to the, uh, to the uttermost in my life, to the extremities in my life? Because God is building his kingdom in your life. Where is God in my circumstance? He is there. In the corner. Find him. That's why we had that message. How? To seek God. And many times... God is not in the extremes and in the uttermosts or the ends of our lives. Many times he, he comes to us in small events. Small reactions, small incidents, things that we think is irrelevant to the kingdom. And then we miss it. If I can remind you, just see where it was. 
Oh, let me just use this chart. We said, if you look at the chart of the, of the Mosaic Tabernacle, we find the judgments of God at the Ark of the Covenant. It talks about where you will find the mind of God. And some time ago we studied about wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Knowledge, da'at, knowledge. Da'at means experimental, personal, intimate experience of his wisdom and his understanding. Wisdom meaning your personal, where you have really discovered and had an experience that you know what you know, and that God is present here, now, in my circumstance, where I am. And that you understand that you will not be severed and you cannot be severed from His love. That you understand what He wants from you in your circumstance. If that becomes a personal awakening and a personal experience, that is called knowledge. The word knowledge is actually abused, an abused word in our society. We think knowledge is something you read in a book, then you know of it. Like the problem in our country is many people know of Jesus. Most people in the church world and in the churches know about Jesus. They can talk and tell you about Jesus. That is not the question. The question is, have you got personal, intimate, experience with him. We've mentioned it last week, I think, maybe I didn't stress it as I should have, and that is that wisdom, fortunately, the one message builds upon the other. When we talk about wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, we did give some teaching a while back or about it, so I, I cannot revert back to that so we just continue from there wisdom understanding knowledge and prudence is so actually in one sense interactivated principles you cannot separate it you cannot separate wisdom from understanding and knowledge and prudence and you cannot separate prudence and with prudence it means behavioral change should I remind you? Behavior. Behavioral. No. Behavioral. Change. It happens here in the fourth corner. Okay. There's no way I can change. If I do not allow him to take him to the extremities and the uttermost and the ends of myself and to discover and find him and meet with him and connect with him in those corner situations. If that happens then, he brings changes in my life. Behavioral changes. Because what he actually does is he changes my character. Or let's not say he changed my character, he he, he cleanses my character in all of that. Last week, I mentioned to you about Proverbs 2 verse 9. We've turned there last week. I would like to add something that I didn't mention last week, or I don't think I did. Maybe you can turn there. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 2 verse 9. Proverbs 2, verse 9. Proverbs 2, verse 9. Let me read to you. The word says, Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Righteousness and judgment, oh, sorry, righteousness, and uh, they, are, yeah, they are to understand. 
righteousness, righteousness, judgment, and uh, equity. You see, I'm pointing here the words that he's using. Righteousness, judgment, and equity. So he talks here about the scale that I've drawn to you. I've drawn with you there. Judgment. Here we find understanding. Uh, knowledge. Prudence, is that right? Yeah. And wisdom here. Let me just do that. And then he says there, Yea, every good path. Now, if you read about Buddhism, you read about the good path. If you read about humanism, which I studied at Varsity, you study, they talk about the good path. What is the good path? What does the Hebrew say? What is the good path? The good, I mentioned to you last week, means functional and purposeful. Meaning all that man seeks after. You will find in functionality and purposefulness. So he says, if you want to know what is functionality, functional and purposeful, Satisfying, which is the same word. Satisfying. Fine. Satisfying. Anything that gives value. Man wants value, but man seeks man. A man seeks man to give him value. And sometimes man gives you value, sometimes man doesn't add value to you. That's the wrong place to look for value. We look at life and we think money is going to give me meaning. Money is going to give me purpose. And you find people get money more than they need and they still look for purpose. And they still look, look, look for meaning. And, 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 and what is their function? You get people everywhere around the world. They are in a specific uh, group. Occupation. Occupation? But still, they don't feel that they have come to their function, what they were really made for. You will only find it here, up here, at the last, uh, at the last corner, when God takes you around and around and around and around. You will find the good, let me write here, the good, then he says path. What does the word path mean? That word path means to revolve. It means a circular path. So, yes, we've learned. We've learned to revolve the circular path. That is where God puts you. If you do not learn your lesson the first time, don't worry. You're going to come around and God's going to take you through that he wants to, uh, brings you back to teach you certain things. If you do not learn, he takes you around and he brings you back to that same principle. And he brings you back to that same principle. So if you and I refuse certain judgments, certain circumstances, and we do not see him in the midst of it, and we do not start to lift up our hands and thank him that he's got a good intention, in the midst of the pain, it's going to use other circumstances, but it's going to boil down to the same judgment that he takes us through. So that would path. Life is a circular movement. We cannot change the course in, what God, in which God has put life in. The course that you are running is a circular uh, course. 
like at, at any stadium where athletes run. You will see it's not a straight line and you set them off and you never see them again. <laughs> you set them off and they run and they come around and they run and they come around and they run and they come around. This is life. Life. Life is a circular racetrack is the real word. Paul uses the word racetrack. It is a circular racetrack on which you are. You cannot change it. If I can give you good advice, listen and learn. I remember when I was a child, there was a, uh, I, I liked those magazines a lot. Look and learn. I would, if I had pocket money, I would buy them and read it. Look and learn. Look and learn. Very good advice. Look and learn. A good path. A path that will teach you what functionality, purpose, satisfaction, and value is about. It is a path of life, a circular racetrack. If you don't learn your lesson the first time, it's going to bring you around many more times till we learn. It's going to take you to the extremities of yourself, to the ends of yourself, whether you like it or not. You're either going to perish in it or grow his kingdom or his character. That is the message to any man and to any person. <clears throat> Last week we've learned that God brings these, he takes us to our extremities. Remember we are talking about these corners. He brings us to our extremities so that he can teach us how to make certain decisions. <clears throat> the closer we come to the balancing bar of the scales, where we will find equity, or an even keel in your walk and in your emotions and in your feelings and in your trusting in him the better for you and me we said remember the judgments we, we I referred you to the uh, mosaic tabernacle and I referred you to the book of revelations where he talks about the ox that we find the head of an ox that we find at, your judge, at the judgment seat. And from there I referred you to the Hebrew alphabet, which is the ox head. Can you see it from there? Talks about the Aleph principle. God is infinite, limitless, The moment we try and put God in our minds that we have a picture of Him, we are actually transgressing. Because He's beyond what you can think with your mind. He's beyond that. That is the ox principle or the aleph. If we go to the Hebrew alphabet. Thus. God moves us in all circumstances. He wants me to get to the, post, to the place that will balance me where I come to the realization that God is now present in my circumstance. Here where I am. What is He? He is omniscient means he, he knows everything. He really knows everything. 
He is everything. He is omnipotent. It means he can do anything. And he is omnipresent. You know, if you just think about those three terms, terminologies that I've used, and you think about your circumstance, it is obvious that God allowed it for a very good reason. Because he could have he could have safeguarded you from it. He could have protected you from it. He could have made you made other decisions that wouldn't have brought you where you were now. Or he could have worked in the other people around you, the role players around you, in their minds so that you wouldn't be in the predicament or the situation or the end of yourself we are on now. Or good, God could have put you in a different circumstance. But he didn't. You are where you are now. So the best and the most wisest thing to do is get grips to your, uh, on, uh, get to grips with yourself and say, God has me here. It is his judgment. I must see what he is aiming at. I must see the things coming up in me, the sin coming up in me, where I miss my purpose. I must repent of that. Because that is what God firstly wants of me. We want the circumstance to change. We want my finances to change immediately. God says, start and focus on the first things first. We talked about it last week. I'm actually doing a uh, revision. Last week we talked about, remember uh, up here, was talking about the noon day judgment. Mishpa and the word noon day judgment and the word and the way and the word so ar, which means noonday judgment, noonday light. It actually talks about so ar, glory light. If you say you want to be in the bride, and if I say I want to be in the grand bride, that's how he clothes me with his so ar, glory, which the bride must and shall have. Noonday glory. So, God takes you through many things where you can either clothe yourself by making the right choices and seeing what is after and repenting of it and trusting me in the midst of it in that way clothing yourself with His glory or not. Last week we said, what we find here, if you look here, and you look at the chart there, here we find the table of showbread. Here we find the candlestick. Therefore, here we find we said here, find love, here where you find life is here where you find light. My dear friends, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm not writing these things because this is what I think. If I can take you through all the studies, you will know this is what we find in the Word of God. Find life when you eat the bread of life. You find his love, you come to the ultimate judgment seat. He does it because he loves us. You find light and you start walking in the light 
of his candlestick, which is the 66 books on your lap. The candlestick consisted out of 66 portions, 66 knobs, bowls, and flowers. You can go and study it. Google it. The 66 portions of light that you need is the 66 books. That's the total books on your lap. And you and I need to walk in, in that light that you receive from those books. Okay. A whole library of books. That's what Bible means. Biblia. It means a portion of a versamelen um, collection of books that do not contradict themselves, that had been written over 1,500 years, that were wrote, written by more than 40 authors, talking about controversial subjects, controversial subjects, but never contradicting one another, without them conversing with one another about the subject. And I can carry on and carry on and carry on that way. So, so our light that comes from the judgment or to so our glory light that he wants, that he clothes his bride with. Let me write down here, bride. We might have a look just now at the scripture that says there. He crows his bride with. To our light talks, uh, you will find in your Strong's Concordance that he talks about noonday and to our glory, it talks about double light. We found that in the Ark of Noah as well. Double light. A double window. A window. To our light. You need light that you receive from eating and studying the Word of God. And from walking in the light. You need both. If I would just study the word of God and not walk in it, I will never get to the portion of noonday glory or noonday light. Is it clear? Now my question when we started off is why do Christians make, many times, not always, why do they make stupid and obvious wrong decisions? Because of false teaching. The false teaching that goes around is that all negative things come from the devil and all positive things come from God. All negative circumstances and things, whatever you can put under negative, uh, comes from the devil and everything that you, you as a human being can put under good comes from God. That's an utter fallacy and a lie. Because ne good needs to be defined, God needs to define good for you, and God needs to define what is negative and evil for you. Then you'll come to a completely different conclusion. All things are God's good judgment. To lead and guide you in a good path. So you and I can get more and more to functionality, satisfaction, purpose, value, as we run in our circular path. Even those that do not serve God and don't even, they are not even interested in his, uh, to know about his existence, they are running in a circular path way, a race course as well. So whether you accept it or not, you are running. So let's turn to Psalm chapter 19 and, con and continue our study uh, from the Word of God from there. Now Psalm 19 is a wonderful psalm to know off by heart, to memorize, 
But let's just talk about a few verses in Psalm 19 concerning judgment. Verse nine, chapter 19, I'm going to read with you from verse 9 to verse 13. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, what is them? Judgments. Is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Right, let's just stand still a little bit at these few verses here. He starts off there in verse 9, he says, The fear of God, the fear of yud he vo he is, meaning now, now, in your, now, where you are now. The fear of God, now, if you have the fear of God as the word intended to have, now, he says, the fear is clean. The fear of God is clean. Now, the word fear is a word that we've previously, previously dealt with, is the word yara, yara, yut, resh, and alef. Yud, Resh, and Aleph. The fear of God is the word Yare. So, it means that the fear of God means where I am now, right where I am now in my life, I must know that God is infinite, infinitely small, where I am. Although He is infinitely great, but I mean, you do not see Him. So He's, and He's omnipresence, present, He's present. Like the, at, like the atoms are present. That is what the youth refers to, like the atoms. All of grace and everything consists out of atoms. Okay, so in your circumstance where you are, he's present with your mind and your reasoning. You allow him to guide your mind and your reasoning. The fact that he's present and the fact, once again, that he's Aleph, he's present, is the beginning. That is called the fear of God. So the fear of God is not something that you say. You, can, you do not say, I fear God. In your thinking, you are reasoning that God is present. God is here. God is now. God is omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's not omnipotent. And he says, the fear of God is now clean. That word clean is the word toher. The word toher, you will find here as well. O tohar, o tohor, toher. You find at the judgment, at the word judgment. It's the word clean. We're not going to turn now to, let, let me quickly turn, to keep your place there, to act, uh, uh, Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, uh, chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. 
talking about the bride, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean to her. To her will take you to the word to her. Noonday. Fine and clean. Yeah, and white. For the white linen, fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And verse, um, verse 14 talks about it as well. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That word clean is the word tohar once again. So you see, the bride will be clothed by many glories and with many glories. One of them is Tohar. Tohar, glory. How will she be clothed? As she had been taken in life through the extremities and the uh, ends of herself in this life as she was taken through many circumstances and things. And she chose him and followed him according to his principles. She get clothed with Tohar on noonday glory. So, for every choice that you make in your tests and trials, every time that you choose Him, you get clothed with a layer of that glory. So you need the fear of God. And I need the fear of God to be clothed with the bridal garment. How do I get the fear of God? We are going to learn here through His judgments. We get the fear of God by Him judging you and me. I've learned that Christians many times become arrogant when they go through difficult circumstances and judgments. That way, my dear brother and sister, you will not be clothed. You'll be clothed with rebellion and darkness and not with the glory, light that the bride will be clothed with. So the fear of God, the word yare, as I've explained, Wrote it to you down just now, spelled it to you, Yare. According to the Hebrew, ancient Hebrew dictionary, it means feelings flowing out of my actions before him as my authority. So, I can easily say I fear God. It's a different thing to fear him. To fear him means, according to the ancient Hebrew dictionary, feelings. It involves your feelings. Feelings flowing out of my actions before Him as my authority. Feelings flowing out of my actions before Him as my authority. So it's not a thing of my mouth saying, I fear God. The feelings in my actions, it means the nature of my actions. The nature of my actions must speak. That I reverence Him as the authority in my circumstance 
where he's taking me through the ends of myself. Verse 9. Let, let us continue with that. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord, which is mispah, In the ancient Hebrew dictionary, the word mishpa means decisions and opinion. You've got an opinion? God has got one as well. You think you're the only one that is the uh, opinion here, that is that can render an opinion? Yes, you can give your opinion. But God is the great one. It's important to listen and adhere to what is his opinion about the circumstance that you're in and about your and my reactions. What is God's opinion about? We act as if God has got no opinion about the way that we are dealing with the matters and dealing with ourselves within the circumstance. The root word and the root meaning of mishpah. The root meaning of mishpah or judgment. The root meaning of what God is doing with you through circumstances is this. It means rulings over cases as well as the actions of, uh, of deciding a case. He says here in verse 9, the word of God says, The judgment, judgments of the Lord are true and righteous. His judgments are true and what? And what? True and righteous. True means, it not means, it is the word emet. Righteous is the word, the word tzada or tzadi. What does it mean, emet? I spelled the word emet to you so many times. Let me just write, spell the word emet to you which is the word true. In ancient Hebrew pictographic language, Aleph, Mem, Taf. His judgments are true. That's why we said last week, you can have your opinion over your circumstance, but you know what? It is based on truth. And it's based on right. It is the true thing that you need, and it's the right thing that I need. It's based on truth and right. It is based on the fact that God is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. It is God's judgment, and you need, and I need, to take up our cross and die daily. So whether you are in a good or a bad or a favorable or unfavorable situation, God's judgment over where you are is true and righteous. Why does he say? All together. Not just the one, not just the other. It's a balanced decision that God has made. Verse 10. Oh, I think we should, in the old time we would say typics, typics. Today we would say delete. Verse 10 out of it. 
Because it says there, his judgments, more are they to, to be desired. More. Verse 10. Verse 11 goes on, and he continues with judgment. He says, moreover. So the Yerichov is coming from, <laughs> to, to be strong about it, and even more strong about it. So in verse 10 he says, more, these judgments, more are they to be desired than gold, and then he continues there, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Now let me tell you, when God had taken me not very long ago to my extremity, to my limits, I know these scriptures, I know them off by heart, I've memorized them. I was like an ostrich when he swallows, not a little stone like this, but when he swallows a brick. Have you ever seen an ostrich swallow a brick? <laughs> he bites on his teeth and his eyes go ding, 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 ding. And God says, swallow it. He goes, I say, Lord, please help me. But I do not desire this judgment. I do not see the value of this. He says, more to be desired are they than gold. And sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. All right? Gold and fine, uh, fine gold. And then he says, sweeter. I said, Lord, you're putting this down my throat, but it's not sweet. It's not desirable. And I said, Lord, work in me. Work in me. Work in me that I will become a spiritual man. A wise bride that will say, My father, if this, if you say this judgment that you are judging me with, this circumstance is to be desired. I want you to work in me that I will desire your judgments. Because I've seen what your judgments have done. And we are where you are taking me. Why you are doing these things? It's not because you hate me. It's not because you are a sad sadist. Or because you are a psychopath. Or because whatever reason. It's because you love me. And that is a, a verstellen. An adjustment, a correction that only God can do for us. So that we will see this judgment and his judgments are to be desired. It must become part of our prayer. Follow that. It's not just one brick. It's a whole few tons of bricks which you cannot follow. If you do not say, Lord, work in me, that I will desire your judgments. And I will start, and I did start then, praying, God, judge me. Judge me. But when you judge me, let me value it. That I get as kostbar see. Desire means something to long, to long for. This sounds like the prosperity gospel, no? That you will find on the signboards outside of a church. In this church, we desire God's judgments. In this church, God's judgments are valued. In this church, God's judgments are sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Will you find Christians stopping there? No, you'll find a few like we see here today. More to be desired are they than gold. It means gold was the most valuable com commodity of that time. It was the currency that was accepted in all countries, gold. If you had gold, so to speak, you had everything. So, what must you desire and I desire? Judgments. And how must those that, that 
judgment. Taste to you, sweet, sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb. Pray, say, Lord, my judgments that you have me in here, please teach me and show me and touch my taste buds and adjust them so it will be sweet to me. His judgments and his verdicts, he wants me to turn to him and say, Lord, it is sweet. It is beautiful. Claudio. That's something different. So, Lord, let your judgments be sweet to me. Let me value it. Sweeter than honey. So I must pray that my attitude over my circumstances, over his judgments in my life, will be, I will really start valuing it as more precious than my salary increase. If I would now say, who would like a salary increase? I think my hands will, my hand will be up the first. <coughs> Some of you will stand up as if you, if you would stand the highest, you will get it, the salary, the greatest raise in your salary. Yes, we would all, if, if I would say, all right, sit down. Who would like God's judgments in their life? <laughs> would we get the same people Jumping up higher, trying to be higher than the next one. So we would say, yes. But do we see how little spiritual we really are? In our judgment of our circumstances. And how idiotious, if there's a word like that. Idiotic, foolish. We can be looking at our circumstances. Right, then he says in verse 11, moreover, he says over and above that, over and above how we must value our judgments, he says, moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. He says, you know what? Or let me put it this way. You put value to your circumstances anyway. Because the moment that something bad happens, immediate thing in your mind is, what did I do wrong? Why does this happen? So you do put value on these judgments. And you do know that circumstances are, his, are judgments. We actually don't need to talk about it. We don't actually need to convince you that that is the fact. Because the moment something bad happens, we immediately say, oh, what did I do wrong? So we're actually saying, I deserve this. Or when something good happens. In Bali, when something good happens, the first thing in us is, oh, I deserve it by now, you know. I'm serving God, I'm choosing Him. I've been saved for 43 years. I've never backslidden. I think I deserve it. That is what comes up in our mind. It's not the right thoughts, but this is what comes up immediately. I deserve it. So, he says in verse 11, by his judgment, I am, <coughs> I am warned. So my first reaction in a, when circumstances happen, things happen, verdicts, Favorable and unfavorable. <coughs> Excuse me. We should say, God, what, is, what are you after? Do you realize that your favorable judgments, your favorable circumstances, are just as much judgments as your unfavorable circumstances? I remember saying to our one son one day, we needed very well in business. Very well. When we say very well, we all mean these things. I said to him, you know what? God is really testing you. This 
is God's judgment. Because usually when things bad happens, we all know, ah, mm, God's judgment. No, his judgments consist of favorable and unfavorable circumstances. And in the midst of both of them, we should embrace them, give God's value to them, and they should taste sweet in our mouths. And it can only be possible in the favorable circumstances when we realize God is speaking to me. It's not because I'm a good guy, good fellow, I've done a good, few good decisions, I've made a few sacrifices, I did a few surrenders, that's why this good happens to me. And then he says, and it says, continues in verse 11, he says, in, moreover by them, by these judgments, he says there, is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. Right, so there's reward in his judgment. I want to see how much you've heard. He says that his judgments how we must look at his judgments have a look in your Bibles and help me there are four things that we must remember start at the beginning his judgments are clean. Right. No. <coughs> uh, yes, they are clean. Then I, I didn't write the clean down there for myself. They are clean. All right. Clean. Yeah, clean actually is the effect. All right. They are true and righteous. What is the second thing? Is my wife the only one reading? Second thing? The value is gold and honey. The third thing there for a warning. And the fourth thing Therefore, a reward. Leer die die uit jou kop uit. Because remember, we said the fear of God is when you start involving your mind, your reasoning, your thinking, and you look at your circumstances and you say, the word of God says my circumstances and these events in my life and these verdicts in my life and these judgments in my life first of all is true righteous I deserve I deserve that secondly the, the value yeah the value of them is that they are precious more than gold and they must be sweet they are sweet although it tastes to me bad and bitter. Now, it is here to warn me so I must see what God is saying to me. And I will be rewarded. Does he talk there about reward or what is the words that he uses when he talks about reward?
What is the word that he uses there? Great reward. A great reward. But when will we be rewarded? What does he say there in verse 11? When will the judgments of God in my life, when will I be rewarded? What does he say there? Keeping them. Keeping his judgments. That word keeping, the word shomar, means I will cherish his judgments. I will embrace his judgments. I will keep his judgments safe to the old fool inside of me because the old fool in me would say, ha, ah. you say, this is God's love. You say, God is good. Never. Will a good God allow so circumstances like these into your life? Never. Never. No, oh, but if you start seeing with a spiritual mind, praying the value of it, and you start embracing it, say, God, this is my salvation. This is brought to me to save me, to make me ready to stand before God's throne. This week, when we traveled up this gravel road of ours, that first house, a double-story house on the left-hand side, was sold on a, a Phelan auction. And we heard this week that that man that bought it, that restored it, that renovated it, died in that house while he was restoring it. And I said to my wife, he gets this bargain, because he bought it with a, at a bargain price, but that was the thing that caused his death. But what did he win? Did he gain? If he knew God, but if he didn't know God, what did he gain? Nothing. He actually gained, gained. I, d I don't know the person at all, so I'm not talking about that person. I don't know him at all. I haven't met him. I don't know how he looked. Nothing. I'm not talking about him. So, if he missed it there, the only thing that he gained was eternal damnation. But in the process of renovating and buying this bargain and doing anything, what did he keep himself busy with? In your, in your struggle with the circumstances that you are wrestling with and struggling with and the different ways of survival that you are busy with, are you keeping that very circumstance, keeping, cherishing it, embracing it, Safeguarding it against the fool because you realize, you know what? This is for my own deliverance and salvation. This I need to prepare me to meet him in front of his throne. That word great reward, great, means heal. The Achilles heel. The heel. It has to do, your heel has to do with walking and it has to do with following. So he says, this reward will follow you. You don't need to go and say, God, I did everything now and where's the reward? The reward will be standing just behind you and say, here I am. Here's the reward. So the reward will be on your heels. We know this principle. Psalm 23 says, uh, uh, Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So if you want goodness and mercy to start following you, without you calling it, I believe in the Christian world there's a thing that you must call blessing. Call. That is Christian witchcraft. You call blessing and you call this and you root it 
en je gooi dus weg, en je jaagt dus weg, dit weg, het omsnert. You call nothing, you call on the name of God. And if you do what the word of God says, you don't need to call anything. The blessing and the mercy and the grace will be right there. The blessings. They keep Christians busy with snert. You know what snert is in English? Snert. <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> Great reward. The word reward means limitlessness. It is the word rab in Hebrew. R-A-B, rab. The, reward, the word reward of rab. is spelled resh bet otherwise pictographic language abundant reward the reward will be your thinking and my thinking will be housing God because he says that and I will excel in the house van the Lord bly in lengte van daar. In lengte van daar beteken, jy woon in die Heerse huis nou, maar is jou huis een spookhuis, vol vlermuise, of is jou huis rechtig, die huis van die Heere? Are your house, the one that you create, your conscience, your mind, your, your thinking, as we've been explaining it through the weeks and weeks and years and months and decades, I can talk about decades, is your house a house full of bats and full of what's been a copper? Spider webs and dragons? Or what type of house are you creating? Tell me about it. Tell me how you are thinking. No, I will watch you in your actions and then I will know what you are thinking. Whether you fear God or not. The reward is limitless. Great reward. Reward will follow you. Let me tell you, if some, somebody is on your track, and you know that, you lift your heels. We were once in a position that I carried another guy's uh, weapon and ammunition and stuff for him because he was finished. I said to him, we are being followed. You cannot allow, I cannot allow you to sit because you will not be alive after a while. We are followed. So, keep on moving. Keep on moving. Right. Verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. God says, how, how on earth will you see your own errors and your own faults? Except if I bring judgment over you and you can see your errors and your secret faults. Those things that your wife are trying to tell you where you act or speak wrongfully, hurting her, that you do not see and do not understand. You immediately understand when God's judgment falls on you. You realize, oh, I shouldn't speak this way. I shouldn't act this way. I shouldn't think this way. I shouldn't say these things. How did you come to that sudden realization? Through God's judgment. The moment that God brings you, God takes you through a certain battery of events. Sure. Sometimes God has got a whole battery boom, 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 of events that you go through. <laughs> when you get at the end of them, you say, all right, I see. Right. Oh, 
I skip a lot of principles here that we could share. At least if I keep on being understand, that you can understand me, then it is important. If we look at the, uh, there are so many checks and, checks and balances in God's kingdom and in God's word. If I can just take you along from where we were or where we are now to a different route. If you think about the, Mose uh, if you think about the Hebrew alphabet, which letter talks about judgment? Okay, all right. Many of them talk a little bit, but which one talks straight about it? <laughs> the mem. The revealed and the concealed. All right. Why does it talk about judgment? Because at the flood, the Noah flood, just between brackets, I would like to say this. If somebody might have that false understanding, the flood was across the whole planet. The whole planet was covered in water. I say that specifically because there are certain beliefs, especially among the Africana people, that not that the judgment of the flood was just in a certain region. All of mankind was destroyed and judged. All flesh was judged. All flesh was judged through the water, mem. But there were a family that learned about atonement. Noah. And he built an ark. According to God's directions. Right. And they survived the judgments. The tough, the cross that I talked uh, I wrote there on the ark, at the ark, in the picture there. Tough is the word for the ark of Moses' of Noah's ark. It is the same word as the word for salvation. The ark of Moses, you'll see there the word ark is the word Yeshua. Ark of Noah, Yeshua. God will send down afflictions. Upon us. And he does send down afflictions on us. To what? To destroy and judge all of your flesh. Amen. To judge your flesh. Alright. The only way that you will survive within God's judgment is if you climb into the ark of salvation. The ark was bitumen from inside, the Bible says, and from outside. It is the word atonement blood, that word pitch. Atonement blood. With the atonement blood will make you to float above the judgments of the flesh. And that Noah just, just, net gedobber, that he just, uh, float on the judgment waters? No. He was actually on his way to a new creation. 
after the judgment of the flesh, there was a complete new dispensation, a new creation for you and for me. So God judges sin. All flesh, we must say sin. And crucifying your flesh because God's judgments fall crucifying your flesh will cause you to float above the judgments so that you can bring you to a new a new day in your life A new day in a certain area. Then, the day after tomorrow, he comes and the floods come down again. What is the letter that follows the mem? What follows the mem? The noon. What does the noon talk about? We talk about, I'm referring, I'm referring you now to the Hebrew letters here. The biblical Hebrew letters here. The noon. In the, in the beginning of a letter, it is written this way. End of a letter, it is written this way. Noon follows judgment. Right. This noon consists out of a zayen, which is truth. But it is truth when you allow yourself to be bent under truth. When you start lifting up the truth in your life, the end of that is you end up start lifting up truth in your life. When you start lifting up truth in your life, that is when you start walking uprightly. That's what that picture is about. only way to look, walk upright is to start lifting up the truth in your life. The only way why you'll get there is when judgments, when you treat the judgments in your life as God wants you to treat and start walking the crucified way and lift up above your judgments and come to a new creation. Because here, the noon talks about Faithfulness talks about freedom. What is the number of noon? What does noon mean? Fifty. Fifty. Fifty is jubilee. Every fifty year, fiftieth year was jubilee, freedom, deliverance from slavery. Freedom, deliverance from slavery of sin. You see where it comes from. Judgment, dealing with judgment the right way leads to freedom, delivery from sin. When was Pentecost? 50 days after the crucifixion. Noon. Therefore, a new anointing of his spirit. Pentecost. When was the word given to Israel? 50 days after they left Egypt. The word was revealed to them, the Torah, in a new way, was given to them. More of the word of God will be revealed to you. There is a price that you need to pay for the word of God to open up to us. To me, this is apologetics in itself. Right. I've got my studies continues and continues and continues. Here from the Old Testament, I wanted to, if we had another two hours, study with you practical 
things in the history of kings that followed and obeyed and adhered to God's judgments and those that didn't. How they ended. Both. If you want God's reward to follow you and to catch up with you, then we must take it. Adhere to God's judgment, deal with it properly, deal with it rightfully. Understand that it is true, based on truth. It is the right thing that God is doing. That is what righteousness means. Based on truth. The right thing that God is doing is judgment on you. And it is worth more than gold, sweeter than honey. It is therefore warning me in you. And there is a great reward. Right, let's pray. Lord, Yud, Hey, Bo, Hey. You are the unbegotten one. Lord, if we just stand still, thinking, about that we start trembling within ourselves knowing that we do not realize with whom we have to do with whom life has to do with and why we find ourselves in different circumstances in different shades of light We want to put our hands in our own bosom and say, Lord, work in me, work through me, that I will look differently to my judgments, your judgments in my life, my circumstances and my situations that I will look and value it and embrace it as you want me to look at it, as you want me to deal with it, as you want me to think about them. Please help me, Lord. It is so contradictory to the way my flesh and self looks and evaluates and judges my circumstances and things and events. Will you create in us your fear? So that we will be clothed with bridal garments coming out of the wilderness leaning on our beloved. In Jesus' name. Amen.